we're getting set up, I wanted to thank everyone so much for uh, anyone that voted for me last year. I had a, oh, yep, I guess we're, uh-oh, uh race condition. There we go, cool, all right, well, we'll see. We'll get you guys out to lunch, I won't take too long. So again, thank you guys so much for anyone that voted for me last year, and uh, thank you so much to Tobias and Amanda and everyone that puts on such an awesome conference. Like, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, this is one of, my, one of my favorite conferences of the year. Last year, it was really kind of one of the first times I spoke at a conference that wasn't a, a hacking and security conference. You know, especially in the US, we kind of you know, get in our own little bubble sometimes. So it was awesome to come out here and really talk with everyone and people that were so interested in a lot of these security components that went along with PowerShell. So this is Catch Me If You Can, PowerShell Red versus Blue. And really what I wanted to do with this presentation was really kind of show the overview of the evolution of the red and blue components of PowerShell. So projects, you know, components of the language and the protections and everything like that. So I, I like to try to convince everyone I'm actually not really a bad guy. I'm actually on everybody's side. So some of the offensive stuff we've done, it's not because we, we hate PowerShell, we just love breaking things or whatever, but we really do want to make stuff better. And we think some of these projects have helped push things in the right direction, at least we hope. So what I'm going to be going over, kind of setting the stage, a little bit of our offensive approach, you know, kind of the infancy of PowerShell and, and the offensive side. Uh, a lot of this stuff uh, was actually kind of written and pushed from uh, Matt Graber, who I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. Um, so Power Syringe was kind of the precursor to PowerSploit. You know, as it starts to grow up, you know, the Invoke Mimicats, the Invoke Reflected PE Injection, Invoke Shellcode, all the really bad stuff that, you know, attackers started kind of repurposing. And then as stuff really started to kind of grow up, yeah, the PowerShell loves the blue team. That post really kind of gave me a heart attack as an attacker. I'll, I'll, go over, I'll go over why here in a little bit. We'll go into PowerShell Empire, which I spoke about last year here on the stage. And that's what, it was definitely terrifying for the, the first time to meet Jeffrey. He was in the audience and I'm talking about PowerShell malware and uh, he was the first person to ask a question and I was pretty terrified and I was wondering if he was gonna punch me afterwards. But uh, it was, uh, had a great conversation and uh, I'm, I'm glad, it, at least he says he doesn't hate me, so. Um, we're going to go over a few more defensive projects, so SimSuite, Bloodhound, um, uh, Get Injected Thread, and some of this really cool stuff that people have been developing, and a little bit towards the future to where some of the kind of the cutting edge obfuscation projects that have come out, a bit with device guard and constrained language mode, and then that, that Get Injected Thread I spoke about. So just really quick and kind of our offensive philosophy and why we chose PowerShell. So we like to take what we call an assume breach approach. Microsoft, similarly, their red teams also really kind of take the same approach to where there's a phenomenal white paper that came out a few years ago called um, Enterprise, Cloud, or, or Enterprise Cloud Red Teaming from Microsoft. And they had this great quote that said, fundamentally, if someone wants to get in, they're getting in, accept that. What we tell clients is, number one, you're in the fight, whether you think you were or not, and number two, you're almost certainly penetrated. This is from Michael Hayden, a former director of the NSA and CIA. So it's really just kind of trying to push to everybody, you know, this mental shift to saying you're not just going to stop everyone from getting in. You have to have layer defenses. You have to have command line logging. You have to have, you know, these cutting edge protections. It's a holistic approach to the problem instead of just here's one blinky box. I push a button and you know it stops everything. What really drew us to uh, PowerShell from the offensive side was this concept of living off the land. There's a really great talk given by Mac Graber and Chris Campbell several years ago at a security conference called DerbyCon that was called Living Off the Land. And at, what, that, what we mean by that is focusing on blending with normal host and kind of network uh, op operations and like options and binaries and things like that. So you, we want to use things that are built in very similarly to how administrators use them so we can you know, kind of blend with the noise and you know, go under the radar whenever we're doing our offensive engagements. So this really led us to, you know, looking at, hey, there's this thing called PowerShell. You know, it, it lets you do pretty much anything, right? So that's really kind of what started our, our focus on looking at this really, really awesome language from, a, from an offensive perspective. So I, I'll take a step back. You know, in the beginning, I, I didn't realize I had almost the same slide as Jeffrey. But, you know, Mona came out in 2002. Uh, PowerShell won, you know, a few years later, but it wasn't something that the offensive community really paid that much attention to because it wasn't built in stock on, you know, like, a, you know, XP and things like that. You might kind of encounter it, but one of the things we have on the offensive and defensive side is you want to minimize the assumptions 
that you make about the systems you're assessing, whether you're doing instant response on them or whether you're trying to attack them. So if we, we didn't want to build an entire kind of attack framework in a language that only existed on a you know, relatively smallish, but you know, a very large number, but percentage-wise, you know, not a huge uh, uh, percentage of the systems that we assess. So you know, it was great. We kind of thought it was kind of cool. A lot of us weren't DevOps and sysadmin, so we didn't pay as much attention to it as we probably should have. And then there was Lite. So PowerShell version 2. This is you know, awesome. This is really kind of what started to, to get a lot of people in the offensive community interested in PowerShell, because once it's installed on Windows 7, you know, by default with version 2, and it's deployed to a large number of environments, once we started seeing the uptick of adoption of Windows 7 around 2009, 2010, that's when the offensive community suddenly realized like a light bulb went on. They're like, oh, you can automate everything, so we can automate all our attack components and all of our attack primitives and start building tools in offensive PowerShell. This also touches a little bit on what I like to call the, the version 2 problem. Originally for us, over the past couple of years, it's been a huge pain with version 2 because, like I said, we want to minimize the assumptions of the, of the systems that we're actually attacking. So I've had to write all of my tools for the last five years to be version 2 uh, compatible. So a lot of the really cool new stuff we heard about last, you know, I heard about last year and we heard about coming out were like classes and version 5 and all those really cool new features I never got to use. I could kind of, you know, view and like appreciate, but it's occasionally would be a pain. There would be a few kind of weird uh, eccentricities of uh, the, the language occasionally of having to backport stuff to v2. But, you know, anyways, it was really, really awesome, and uh, the offense community started paying attention. So this is really the first public uh, presentation or information about using PowerShell from an offensive perspective. I have no idea how happy, uh, like, you know, Lee and Jeffrey and Bruce and everybody was when this came out, but uh, it was a presentation in 2010 by someone named Dave Kennedy, who is a really well-known uh, security researcher, and he, he runs uh, the DerbyCon conference and stuff back in the U.S. So he gave this presentation at DEF CON, which was the, you know, the oldest and the biggest hacking conference in the entire world. It happens in the, the summer in Las Vegas. So it was PowerShell OMFG, and what they really talked about was like, hey, everybody, there's this thing PowerShell, we should really start using it. So they, they touched on a, a few small components of it. They really focused on execution policy because you know, we didn't know any better, so we really thought like, oh, execution policy, oh, look, you can just bypass it. And I think Jeffrey had a tweet eventually a few years ago. It was like, we wish we would have named this like execution policy is not a security boundary dot something, you know, this really, really, really long thing. Because from the offensive side, a lot of people really fixated on this execution policy thing. But anyways, uh, one of the things they released was called PowerDump, which was a PowerShell script that lets you extract power passwords from the local SAM database. It used add type. You know, it was, it, was, uh, it was really groundbreaking at the time. You know, we look back now and it seems somewhat simplistic, but this is really the genesis of everything. And from the offensive side, we owe a lot to uh, Dave Kennedy of uh, bringing attention uh, to, to PowerShell as you know, something we can look into from the security perspective. And then this is, uh, this is Matt. He's sitting in the front row. Uh, Matt used to be my boss up until a few months ago, so this is his nice, uh, you know, embarrassing sticker head. But Matt's really, Matt saw that presentation. He was on a, a red team at the time and started realizing, wow, there's way more power in this than even you know, Dave Kennedy and a lot of us really realize. So I like to think he, you know, he ate from the, the tree of knowledge and he was poisoned forever as far as on the offensive side. But, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff on the, the really cool work in the past few years from the offensive and defensive side has heavily been driven by Matt over the past several years. So I, I owe a lot to him for really kind of bringing me into the fold and answering all my stupid questions and very politely being like, you know, your script is crap, but, you know, very politely saying it, here's, here's how you can do it a lot better. So uh, we, we owe a lot to Matt uh, in the security side. Uh, side note, he got beamed up to the mothership two months ago. So uh, good, good for you, Matt. You know, uh, we miss him. Uh, you know, I, like I said, uh, Jared and I used to work with him. You know, we, we miss him a lot, but we're still out in Seattle, and he still lets us uh, bounce a bunch of dumb questions off of him. So, sorry? Oh, yeah, they took only his head. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I, I know Matt's uh, going to be working on kind of the Defender ATP team and a lot of the really cool cutting edge security stuff. And he kind of shows this pattern of, you know, us security guys, once we get tired of breaking stuff and we actually grow up, people tend to start mo moving towards defense. So, you know, we'll see in a few years if I end up there as well, but I don't know. 
So kind of learning to walk, you know, this is, you know, okay, like Matt was like, there's some really cool stuff we can start doing with this. At the time with version two, you know, you had some transcription, you know, the execution policy stuff, but there weren't a huge, huge number of kind of security protections in it. And I don't blame anybody for this, obviously, because what other scripting language has tons of security protections in it. So it was just like, we're making a language. And then like, oh crap, people are using this for security. And PowerShell is really one of the only languages that really took this seriously going forward, which I'll show. So the true offensive start was this post that Matt put out in 2011 uh, called Power Syringe. So it was a PowerShell-based uh, code injection utility. So I'm going to use this, this term shell code a lot. And what I mean by that is it's position-independent code. So it's, an, in the attacker standpoint, it's a way to take a little bit of code, inject it into another process, and have it load up your remote access Trojan and your malware and things like that in memory without touching disk. Because obviously, from the offensive perspective, we want to stay off of disk as much as possible because, you know, at least at the time, there's a lot less chance of getting caught. So Matt came out with this power syringe thing. Really, really cool. Uh, it's actually been the technology and the approach has been repurposed into a lot of open, so uh, open source and like even commercial uh, attack frameworks, most notably Metasploit, if anyone's seen any of that stuff. So you know, after that, uh, Power Syringe eventually is actually what became Powersploit. So on the red team Matt was working on, along with Chris Campbell and a, and a few other people, they were like, oh, there's a lot more stuff we can do with this. We can log keystrokes. You know, we can, uh, we can get screenshots and things like that. So if you saw my presentation last year about PowerShell Empire, a lot of the components of Empire and a lot of the operational things it can do really track back to PowerSploit, which started, you know, back in about 2011, 2012. One of the most common pieces in PowerSploit is invoke shellcode, which, again, it, it allows you to inject that position independent, independent code into your current process or into a foreign process. Uh, a really fun little thing that happened a few years ago is Matt, Matt got annoyed that attackers are downloading it directly from GitHub. So he actually changed invoke shellcode to invoke dash dash shellcode. And then the original invoke shellcode just popped up a message box that said, like, I'm a stupid attacker that downloads stuff straight from the internet that I don't control. Uh, and there's a bunch of GitHub issues, and people were like, whoa, what's going on? And he was just like, you know, close it. Uh, it, was, it was pretty funny. I laughed pretty hard. So again, you know, some common post-exploitation features were, started to be added. And then PowerShell version 3 came out in September 2012. So what we really saw here is that the team started paying attention, like, oh, there's this security thing. Let's start moving in the right direction, particularly with module logging that was introduced. Uh, we didn't actually, I haven't actually encountered a huge amount of version 3 from the offensive side because we didn't really see that much 8.1. A lot of clients tend to skip it. Uh, most people, sadly, are still using Windows 7, but we keep trying to push people uh, towards Windows 10, and I'll talk about a lot of the protections and the big reason for that from our perspective here in a second. So adolescence. This was, uh, you know, this is when offensive PowerShell hit puberty, for sure. So invoke reflected PE injection was a, a tool written by somebody named Joe Bialik, who actually works at Microsoft, and he wrote this when he was on the Microsoft Red Team. So I know that uh, annoyed a few people, but we're super, super happy he introduced this because it's an awesome, awesome, awesome bit of tech. And what it does is it's essentially a, a PE or a binary loader in memory. So you can take any Windows binary, you know, and encode it in a certain way and drop it into this invoke reflected PE injection, and it'll load this, the binary up completely in memory and let you run stuff without touching disk. And they wrote this because they got tired of wanting to recode all of their tools in PowerShell. So he's like, let me just write a wrapper that lets you load anything. Pretty cool. Uh, then the really, really big one was invoke Mimikatz, which, uh, you know, who has not heard, not heard of Mimikatz? Anybody? All right, all right, okay, maybe a couple of people, probably, I don't know if some people are lying or not. But uh, Mimikatz is a tool written by a French researcher named Benjamin Delpy. It's most notably known for allowing the dumping of plain text passwords from memory. Really, really cool stuff. I remember last year when I showed that, I always hear gasp. Because everyone remembers the first time they saw Mimikatz. But uh, it does way, 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 way more stuff than just pulling passwords out of memory. So uh, you can do tons of stuff with Kerberos, DP API, uh, uh, domain controller replication stuff. It's, it's an amazing, from our perspective, an amazing attack uh, tool set. So I'm going to try to flip over and show a really quick demo of Mimikatz without dumping plain text passwords. Okay, so I have a PowerView and Mimikatz loaded up here. So I'm, I'm going to use a little bit of PowerView stuff to gather a bit of information on the domain. And essentially, what I'm going to be doing here is constructing a golden ticket, which is a forged ticket granting ticket. And I'm going to construct it in a way 
that I inject the SID history into, uh, in, into the ticket to where if I run this from a child domain and I change the SID history of the ticket to be enterprise admins of the parent domain, then I can instantly hop up a trust, which really kind of blew my mind the first time I saw it. I don't have enough time to go over all of it here on stage, but I'm, uh, if anyone's interested in this, please, please grab me after or you know, at some point in between. So I'm going to take the, the SIDs of these domains, I'm going to take the Kerberos signing key, known as the KRB TGT, of the child domain, and then I'm going to add the SIDs. That SID is the SID of the enterprise admins in the parent domain. And when I run this, again, all through PowerShell, without, I can do this without touching disk. It's going to uh, run it, inject it in, and the moment that ticket's injected in, that grants me enterprise admin rights on everything in the forest, because the forest is the trust boundary, not the domain. So I can hop straight up. Um, you know, you see this is the Mimikatz output. You know, again, we can do this without touching disk. So kind of, at least, you know, to me, I thought that was really, really, really cool because we could demonstrate to clients, like, hey, Microsoft's been saying domain's not the trust boundary. Like, this is, this is why. You should probably look at this. Uh, the second component we're going to run is something called DC Sync, which uh, Benjamin, let me go and pause that for real quick. Benjamin implemented basically a, a, uh, a clone of the functionality used by domain controllers for replication between each other. So this script, through Mimikatz and PowerShell and everything off a of disk, if I have the rights, I can say, hey, domain controller, I'm also a domain controller. Give me the hash of anyone I want. So it, and if you look at it on the wire, it looks just like you know, the normal domain uh, replication kind of component. So I'm running this, and then I'm running DC sync against the forest domain. So I just hopped up the trust you know, and, uh, literally in one minute, and uh, it can compromise the domain. So I've actually done pretty much exactly that with Invoke Mimikatz on client sites before, and it, it always blows their mind. So all right, PowerShell starting to grow up. The Invoke Reflective P injection was a really big thing. Uh, one of the, this is kind of right when I started getting involved with everything, right around 2014. So I, I've only been pen testing for about a year at this point. I saw this really cool stuff in the work Matt and Joe and everybody were doing. I was like, well, the one thing if I was missing was like kind of really advanced uh, domain and active directory enumeration. So I started writing a tool called PowerView, which I talked about in one of the side sessions last year. And it's, uh, again, it's that active directory kind of situational awareness tool. It's kind of like a version two recoded, or it's like a, a, almost like a version of the recoded active directory commandlets that are compatible with version two, along with a, a large number of additional features like hunting for users and session enumeration, a lot of this stuff. So I recently did a rewrite of this a few months ago because I tried to make it actually PowerShell uh, like proper, so I have credential support, I named all the attributes just like they should have been names and all that kind of stuff. So Alexander and everybody made me feel really guilty about having really bad coding practices. So, oh, and I have to have pester tests for PowerView and like PowerSploit and stuff. So we actually do, uh, you know, like testing on our offensive code, which made some people laugh, but. Um, and I'll, wrong this time, this isn't PowerShell specific, but Microsoft and the, the ATA team, the Advanced Threat Analytics team, released some really cool tools last year called NetSys and Samaritan. So NetSys blocks a really common attack primitive we do, which is session enumeration. We use the net session and num API call. We run against file servers and DCs, and it tells us kind of who's logged in where. But we can do this as a domain authenticated user that's not elevated, it's not admin. So they release some tools that help you lock down the permissions. Samaritan helps you lock down remote SAM enumeration that lets you get the local admin stuff and all that. If any, again, if anyone's interested in that, I, I would love to talk about it. Around this time, too, Konzo, which is an instant response framework, was released. It lets you get you know, profiles, auto runs, all this really kind of cool stuff against a large number of machines. That was written by Dave Hall. And Uproot from Jared. Uh, came out in 2014 and really kind of came into its own 2015, 2016. And this is a power, uh, it's a WMI based kind of IDS that abstracts away a lot of the complexities of doing WMI event subscriptions uh, focused on defensive purposes. So, you know, if uh, someone adds a local admin or if any different kind of really cool events happen, it's like an automatic triggering type framework and it's deployed using PowerShell. Uh, 2014, Graber released uh, PowerShell Arsenal, which is a reverse engineering toolkit for kind of malware analysis. I think around this time is doing um, reverse engineering at, uh, at Flare and Mandiant. So, you know, we start seeing like it's the, the pace is starting to pick up, right? There was, a, you know, a few kind of offensive tools and then there's starting to be a large number of defensive stuff that starts moving in this direction. So a little more really, really cool thing. Um, 
PS Reflect. So we do a lot of API access whenever we do offensive and defensive type stuff. So if you're like, well, if you want to call, do an API call, why don't you just use add type, right? Like, why would you not use that? It's, it's easy, it's simple, you can use the, the p-invoke signatures and all that. Uh, the reason we don't like add type from an offensive and kind of a hunt defensive perspective is that it leaves a lot of artifacts on disk because it implicitly calls csc.exe in the back end. And there's, if you run, it, if you run a, like an add type thing through sysmon um, or procmon, you see like a large number of different events and files created and all these different types of things. So uh, there's a couple ways you can do API access through like a bunch of reflection tricks that were very, very difficult, or very complex, very difficult, very easy to mess up. So Graber wrote a library called PS Reflect that is essentially like a, a series of helper functions, kind of like C types for Python. So it abstracts away all the complexity of doing structs, enums, and API call access in PowerShell. We use this both from an offensive and defensive perspective. So PowerView and PowerUp, two of the projects I wrote, use this extremely, extremely heavily. And uh, things like Git Injected Thread and some of the like more advanced defensive type projects also started using PS Reflect for their Win32 API access. And from my perspective, this is a really huge kind of missing link, at least, at least for us. It was like really easy, uh, operationally safe way, uh, all in memory to access the underlying components that we really need to access. So I don't know if you've noticed, I've been doing you know, red and blue for the, the offensive and defensive, and there's a few that are purple. So PS Reflect, it felt like it wasn't, a, it wasn't inherently uh, evil or you know, you know, uh, blue, so left it there. So uh, then a few years later, or you know, around 2000, late 2014, we had this long Twitter exchange to where you know, we, we saw where PowerShell was going from a defensive perspective. And a lot of people started picking up, like just detecting PowerShell.exe launching. So we wanted to figure out how can we run all our PowerShell stuff without starting PowerShell.exe. So originally, there was a project from a former coworker of mine he released called SharpPick, which is just a POC, super simple. Uh, uh, C sharp like uh, PowerShell run space type type runner. So you know just ten lines. You know load up the the PowerShell script runner object. You know run it from C sharp. I'm like cool. And then Lee Christensen, who's a current coworker of mine, released this amazing tool set called Unmanaged PowerShell. This lets you run PowerShell code or any C sharp .NET code in an unmanaged, meaning like C or C++ uh, process space. So it's, it's a bunch of black magic underneath that I kind of understand but don't really understand. But it lets you load up uh, the CLR and then load up a C Sharp assembly that then lets you run all your PowerShell. And for us, from the offensive side, this is another huge missing link because it lets us take this and inject code into a different process, even LSAS, which is silly, but we did it for, you know, just for giggles. And then in that code, it'll load up .NET, load up the CLR, and then run our PowerShell code. So this is what Empire uses for kind of its process injection stuff. So we can run our malware and our offensive components without starting PowerShell to DXE. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. March 2015, Jared released the start of Power Forensics, which he's, uh, Jared's going to have a really cool uh, uh, like kind of a defense blue team type, uh, is, I think it's called Flip the Script. It's near the end of today, so he's going to go over in-depth on Power Forensics and get injected threads. So if you're interested in any of that, definitely check his session out. Power Forensics lets you do live disk forensics with PowerShell, so it uses uh, create file to get a handle to disk, and he re-implements a lot of these parsers and everything uh, manually through, uh, like, uh, uh, through PowerShell. So he can actually do a lot of like registry parsing, uh, uh, shim cache and like a lot of different things actually do live disk analysis and forensics on a system without having to shut the system down, you know, ship the drive to encase and stuff like that. So I'm do a really quick unmanaged PowerShell demo because I think it's I think it's nifty. Oh, I have no idea what that says. <laughs> what 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 do I what what do I do? Nine? Okay. All right, sorry. I'm a stupid American. I don't know any other language. <laughs> so uh, this is invoke PS inject, which is a, 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 uh, an abstracted uh, PowerShell script that's like, it's a PowerShell script that lets us run PowerShell in a different process, right? So it, it injects all the code and handles all the complexity. So I'm showing this little code block. It just, you know, it's a git process. It does like a little window pop up, right? So OK, in normal, you're running from the ISC. That makes sense. So I'm going to take that same code. I'm going to convert it to a base64 string. I'm going to launch up a, a sacrificial notepad process. Then I'm going to take this PS inject with the proc name and notepad, you know, the, uh, the malicious code. It can be anything you want. I'm going to inject it in and have, have it running verbose. This actually uses Joe Bialik's uh, reflective PE injection in the back end. 
but it lets us run, you see here, that same, oh, I gotta back up, I gotta pause, I was talking too much. So we have that same, that same script block that was injected into Notepad, it loaded up the CLR, it ran this PowerShell code, and you see like, hello, this is PowerShell code running from Notepad. So again, this is kind of the off, you know, one of the missing links offensively for us to, you know, kind of this cat and mouse starting to get around some of the command line logging and different things that all you defenders started trying to, trying to stop us with. So a little side note, uh, Lee Holmes, we love Lee Holmes from the PowerShell team. He's participated with us kind of on the offensive side, or he's interacted with us on the offensive side very, very frequently. And actually last year at, at DerbyCon, uh, you know, again, that huge uh, security conference, uh, Jeffrey and Lee actually did the keynote. So it was really, really cool to have them kind of come out and interact with all of us hackers. So it was cool stuff, and like Lee really pays attention very, very closely to a lot of the, the evolution of the offensive primitives and on our side. So uh, oh, one of the things that I mentioned with the invoke PS inject is by default, it'll try to load the, the lowest version of PowerShell that's installed. So when you inject in, it'll try to load version two before it loads anything else. Why would we do that? Because version two doesn't have all the awesome logging and security protections that the newer versions of PowerShell have. So Lee noticed this, and he you know, recently, uh, just a few months ago, did an awesome post on, I mean, all his posts are awesome, but this one it was, was really, really cool, about detecting PowerShell downgrade attacks. So you, know, you can start PowerShell with just dash version two, or, but even if you're injecting into memory, he talks about doing um, some different event log stuff and some, uh, some really cool things on starting to detect some of these, like what he calls downgrade attacks, specifically to version two, to get around a lot of the uh, a lot of the defensive logging stuff that we started running up against. So, mad props, and you kind of see he's paying attention. We're kind of going back and forth, right? So the big one, though, some parental guidance. Uh, this PowerShell loves the blue team post. This was released one month before I was planning on releasing Empire at DEF CON, and I had an existential crisis. I was like yelling at my boss, I was like, oh my god, offense is dead. Oh no, I just want to quit this job, I have to go be a defender now. But uh, it, it was a really, really cool post that outlined a lot of the version 5 defensive protections that came out, specifically AMSI, uh, better transcription, um, and script block logging, which I'll go over in depth here in a second. So AMSI the anti-malware scan interface. This is what really terrifies me going forward as, a, as an attacker. So it's a, I don't fully understand AMSI, but it's, it's an abstracted technology that allows different AV engines to hook the interpretation of the PowerShell script blocks at a really, really low level. So if you do a lots of different kinds of uh, obfuscation, if you base64 encode your stuff and decode it and execute it and do all this, AMSI allows AV engines to scan the code that's actually interpreted by the scripting engine. So pretty much no matter what you do, at some point your malicious code is going to have to be decoded and run, and AMSI and Windows Defender can scan all that in memory, which terrifies me. But you know, cat and mouse, uh, bypasses will always exist. You know, it, this, hugely raised the, raised the bar, but nothing is 100% silver bullet. So Graber actually did a, a AMSI bypass in a tweet about a year ago, all that thing up there where he, he basically says, you know, it sets like an initialization variable in memory that was like user accessible memory to say, oh, the engine didn't initialize and it all just turns off. Um, one of my coworkers recently released a, a com hijacking AMSI bypass using some HKCU versus HKLM really cool com stuff to, to say that the engine is initialized. So again, this isn't saying AMSI is terrible and we shouldn't use it and whatever else. It's just showing that, I mean, nothing's 100% perfect. But these things are, you know, patched now. So good. But I'm sure there are other ones out there. <laughs> So a little bit on the defensive stuff from version five, you know, transcription, the ability to record, automatically record the contents of a PowerShell session, uh, module logging, which is cool of version three, um, some good execution details, but from the p defenders I talked to that used it, there would be a huge amount of data. Uh, this is de definitely, definitely improved with the deep script block logging in v5 that records all the code block snippets as they're executed. Even if we're injecting into another process, it's not just PowerShell DXE, it's the engine because like we know, PowerShell isn't just PowerShell.exe like Jeffrey covered. So on also by default, even if you don't have the deep script block logging enabled, there's a series of uh, suspicious function calls that Lee Holmes scraped from like the, power, uh, the PowerSploit framework and a lot of other attack frameworks, that if any of those commands, a lot of the primitives that we have, if they, uh, if AMSI, or no, if the, uh, the script block logging engine sees those, it'll automatically log the script blocks for suspicious stuff. So really cool to see 
like, you know, if we run pretty much anything, you know, with something that has version 5 enabled, there's going to be a transcription of everything in the event log, which, you know, it's, it's really terrifying from one perspective, but also we, d I mean, how many clients actually do proper event log forwarding, take everything, analyze everything, do it all at scale? You know, like Jeffrey mentioned earlier today, there's the possibility of doing it, and then there's practically implementing it. So, but still awesome to see the, the direction it's going. And then kind of the rebellious teenager, this was uh, PowerShell Empire. I won't spend too much time on this because I talked last year, like I mentioned. But it's a full PowerShell-based remote access Trojan, or basically malware. So it wrapped up a lot of the components of PowerSploit, a lot of the, the really cool offensive technologies that had been released, and then build a fully functioning uh, like, you know, piece of malware. So it, it has like full like kind of crypto, it has full tasking and all this kind of stuff. And this really was, to me, it, was, it started kind of as a proof of concept because I was interested of like, can I write a, you know, a piece of malware completely in PowerShell? Uh, you can, I didn't think the project was gonna blow up kind of how it did, so it's, it's pretty popular. But, you know, again, we actually don't really use it that much anymore because we started to encounter higher security systems. And I'll kind of talk about we're actually starting to move away from PowerShell from the offensive side, kind of how Jeffrey mentioned the, uh, the Microsoft Red Teams did. Uh, uh, kind of a side note, Lee Holmes started coming up with some, he started noticing, you know, there's some obfuscation, right? So, all right, if you have script block logging, you know, you do kind of really basic, like base64 and then decode and that kind of stuff. Uh, people started noticing that, and then the counter from the offensive side was to do really crazy kind of uh, script-based obfuscation. So, Lee has a couple of really cool posts on detecting the offensive PowerShell of doing frequency and token analysis. And I think it was a like cosine similarity for the latest one that, that happened uh, late last year. So the PowerShell team is paying attention, and I'm, I'm terrified of what they're actually going to come up as far as you know, de-obfuscating, detecting stuff kind of going forward. But one of the things Lee noticed was if you actually run these types of analysis across large numbers of scripts, even you know, on posh code in the gallery or on your own systems, like most of them look very, very, very normal, so it's extremely easy to detect the obfuscated, uh, offensive type, you know, malicious type code if you actually have an ability to run this type of analysis on all, you know all the samples. So cool stuff going forward. I'll d show a really quick uh, AMSI versus Defender demo of this is what makes our life a lot harder. So. Windows 10 fully updated. I try to paste invoke Mimicast, just in, you know, Defender blocks it, which kind of, you know, makes sense. It's a well-known script. So then I'm gonna, I'm just gonna show like the detection details. Then I'm gonna bring up a PowerShell window and do kind of what we call the download cradle, just that um, new object net.webclient.download string and then pipe that all into an invoke expression. So that's the most common kind of attack pattern. I've probably written that I don't know how many thousands of times whenever I've been on engagements. So we're gonna you know, run that. So I should have Mimikatz, invoke Mimikatz completely load up in memory. I try to run it and nothing happens. So AMSI detected this purely completely in memory and actually flagged in Defender for it, for it working. I'll show the, I'll zoom in here in a second. So go a little pop up, you know, go down to this detection and you see down here you know, AMSI actually detected this purely in memory. So it's, yeah, it's really, really cool. All right, I'm gonna go a little bit faster because I think I'm, I'm starting to run out of time. I wanna get you guys to lunch. Oh, I have enough time, okay. So uh, other cool projects that started coming out from the defensive side in the last couple of years. SimSweep was a project worked on by, by Jared and Matt again. It's a Sim-based defensive sweeping tool. So it's ability to run um, a lot of these really cool enumeration functions over, you know, WMI or WS man, and do it at scale. So it, you know, they re-implemented like auto runs and things like that, to where you can sweep your entire network, pull all the data back, and then pipe it into Elk or Splunk or something like that. And this is actually one of the, uh, this approach is something we do when we do our our offensive, or sorry, our defensive hunt type. Uh, engagements or trying to find bad stuff in the environment. So it's, again, it's kind of a snapshot in time, but it lets you sweep your network for a lot of stuff that might look like really bad things and then pipe it all in and do analysis on it. Uh, Bloodhound is kind of, 
you know, it definitely uses PowerShell, so it's a tool set I was one of the co-founders of is released last year. It's an Active Directory attack path analysis framework. So, you know, who's logged in here, who has admin rights to what, and doing a visual mapping through a graphing database to figure out offensively or defensively what the attack chains might be. So it actually uses a modified version of PowerView for the ingester. We're currently rewriting it in C Sharp for a little more stability because of the V2 run space stuff that made my head explode. So we had a guy that knew C Sharp, so he's starting to recode it and hopefully be a little more stable. Um, also, a really, really cool thing that Matt came up with as far as WMI events. He came up with an event that will detect if someone loads the system.management.dll into a process that's not PowerShell. So right here, select from you know, this uh, Win32 module load trace, where the file name is like you know, this wildcard for the, the PowerShell core you know, like library in the back end. So if you deploy this WMI event, you know, whether through Uproot or something else, there is a way natively on Windows to figure out, are we injecting PowerShell, or you know, are we injecting PS inject or whatever in the, the PowerShell uh, whole you know, run space and everything into a different process. And he actually has a gist right here that takes a memory dump every time a PowerShell process closes. So even if it's injected into something else, and it's loaded up that system management.automation.dll, there's a way you can uh, facilitate this. So kind of cool, you know, back and forth. You know, we command line logging, we find a way to run it without it, and there's, there's still hope. Then things get really complicated pretty recently. So Daniel Bahannon is a, a red teamer and kind of blue teamer who works for FireEye. Last year, he released this awesome, awesome tool called Invoke Obfuscation. He's spoken about it at Blue Hat and a few other conferences, I'm sure. If, uh, if you just search Invoke Obfuscation presentation, definitely watch it. He's a great presenter, and it's a really, really cool tool set. So it's kind of an encyclopedia of every possible way you can possibly obfuscate scripts. So you know something that just might be you know sys, uh, that net that web client download cradle. This is what it looks like, you know, in a in the event log for like the version five type stuff. So he has these crazy token obfuscation, like string obfuscation, anything you could possibly imagine. So. This really kind of upped the game, and I know Lee Holmes is really interested in it, and this is what caused him to write his more recent uh, deobfuscating, obfuscated PowerShell component. I'm going to skip that demo real quick. I'll, I'll do one of the ones at the end. And then also kind of going towards the future, with device guard allows for the enforcement of constrained language mode. So, you know, the, uh, it locks it down enough to where we can't access the Win32 API, and we can't access a, a, a good chunk of the underlying .NET framework. But you can still use, like, all your normal commandlets, all your normal, like, signed Microsoft uh, uh, of functions, right? So it doesn't really impede usability for most people, but from the offensive side, constrained language mode breaks nearly everything in PowerSploit. It breaks nearly everything that I've written. So it's really cool technology, and with Device Guard, you can sign this with the new hypervisor based uh, security model they're going towards with Windows 10 to where there's really no way, or I imagine there might be a way, I'm sure Matt might correct me, but this, you know, there's usually, there's supposed to be no way to actually disable this. So it's, uh, it's definitely a huge reason to start moving more towards Windows 10 because it really, really can just break everything. I haven't really gone up against too many things with constrained language mode in the field, but it would break a lot of our tool sets. Uh, kind of though, in response, you know, again, it's not 100% silver bullet. Uh, Chris Trunser, who I, who I used to work with and now works at FireEye with Daniel, wrote a tool called WMI, uh, WMI Plan or WMI Implant, which is a PowerShell-based and WMI-based toolkit that deploys functions even in constrained language mode. So it's essentially a lot of offensive functions written in WMI. But the deployment mechanism is through PowerShell will work in constrained language mode. So he, he talked about that in a few uh, security conferences, actually at the Troopers Conference, just a month or two ago, security conference here in Germany. So it's a, it's a really cool kind of counter again, right? So you know, we keep going back and forth, back and forth, and security and everything is getting better the more we do this. Also, kind of as a side note, so um, Beef or Ruben, uh, Ruben and myself are actually now the only maintainers of PowerSploit. Matt decided not to uh, continue developing all the offensive PowerSploit code now that he works on Microsoft. So uh, we, we are now the maintainers of PowerSploit, and he's been doing a lot of really cool stuff with the kernel. So he, he actually has a uh, GitHub repo that has a lot of like PowerShell kernel exploitation primitives. So it's a way to interface in with the octals and stuff, and he's recoded some of the, the leaked kernel exploits, weaponizing them through PowerShell. Again, stuff I don't really understand, but I think it's super cool that he's doing all this really advanced stuff. And he's, uh, this is really his focus area kind of going forward over the next year. And then this is really terrifying for me, and I'm, I'm nearing the end here, but Jared's going to talk more about this in depth uh, later today. But git injected thread is a script he released just recently 
that allows you to find uh, code and thread injection across systems. And you can deploy this you know, at scale using an approach like SimSuite, or not like SimSuite, but uh, you, if you can use like a push, um, a push type record model or you know, remoting model or whatever else, you can run this at, at scale. It catches nearly all of our stock malware injection techniques. It catches Metasploit, it catches you know, like Empire, it catches anything that injects code, you know, stock, or you know, whatever the normal uh, kind of techniques they use are, it detects them injecting to another process. Essentially, it'll find you know, if threads have a, a, an initial memory page that's allocated, but it's not backed by a file on disk, that it's like, hey, that's really suspicious. There occasionally can be false positives, uh, I believe Jared told me, but it's, a, it's really, really cool, and I'll do just really fast showing you. So I'm gonna run that same kind of PS inject demo that I ran before, so I'm gonna inject into that notepad, same exact code. All right, so I'm running from notepad, and then I'm gonna run this get injected thread and it's going to enumerate all the threads on the system and find in any of the, th it's going to enumerate all the processes and all the threads and any thread that is not backed by file on disk, it's going to like flag, tell you exactly where it is and it'll actually give you the first 100 bytes of that code that you can analyze and figure out is this, is this bad or not. So you see the injected, we see, uh, all right, there's some of the bytes. You know, it found that right in Notepad and you see how quick that was. It was just a second or two and it scanned everything on the system and figured out, hey, there's some malicious code or Empire or Metasploit or something injected into this. And then you can even pull out, I think at the bottom I have the, you know, oh yeah, he, he pulls out a ton of information about the, the memory state and you know, like permissions and all that kind of stuff. And then yeah, here at the bottom you can actually see the, uh, you know, the size of the injected component and also the bytes, which is pretty cool. So you can do some automated analysis. Yeah, cool stuff. <laughs> Good job, Jared. So almost done. I know whenever we talk about some kind of security stuff or attacking PowerShell and using it for evil, people will always ask, like, what should I do? Or people say, I'm, get, I'm just going to disable PowerShell. And we don't recommend disabling PowerShell because we're like, in some ways, you almost want attackers to use it. Because with version 5 and Windows 10 and everything, you can stop really bad stuff from happening with Defender and AMSI. Uh, and you get that really deep script block logging to where you get like a report of everything the attacker did. Like you don't get this by running like, you know, just Xs or by running Python code or whatever else. To where if you're actually monitoring and analyzing all your logs at scale and doing event log forwarding, like in some ways, if you're a sophisticated enough company, in some ways you almost want them to use PowerShell because you get so much information about what they're actually doing in like a step-by-step -step transcription and playbook of exactly what the attackers are doing on that system, which for some people can be extremely, extremely useful. Um, command line logging in general, it really trips us up a lot. Again, there's ways around it, but when you're trying to get initial, initial access to a system and do all this kind of stuff, uh, command line logging with, you know, there's a million different project, uh, products that do this. Uh, full transcription, you know, if possible, and definitely install v5, Uninstall v2, which is a really important thing that people don't realize because of those version downgrade attacks that we can take advantage of. So uninstall version 2 uh, and just use Windows 10. Just get your company to push to Windows 10. We, we've been trying to push clients towards it for at least a year. You know, there's a lot of people going back and forth. Well, like, it's so just, just do it. Just, just do it. Um, if you want to get really fancy, you know, use that device guard and constrained language mode. It's actually a really great resource from FireEye that talks about all these logging and all these different protections in depth operationally about how you can actually uh, do this stuff. So you search like PowerShell logging FireEye on Google and you can find it. It's a great reference for any defenders out there that want to implement this stuff really easily. So in summary, there's a huge variety of offensive and defensive projects. It's been really cool over the last few years and kind of the back and forth that, that it's been evolving. You know, we're going to continue to play cat and mouse of red versus blue. PowerShell version 2 is still a really big Achilles heel from our perspective that people just didn't really quite realize. They're like, oh, we upgraded to version 4 or 5, we're fine. Like, no, there's still a little bit of a gap area that you want to you wanna try to patch. And the tide has really started to shift towards blue from our perspective. And because the, the efforts of the PowerShell team and a lot of the defensive projects, we're on our red team are actually moving away from using PowerShell, like I mentioned. We're going to start coding a lot of our stuff in C Sharp or you know, just you know, raw C and C++. C Sharp is nice for us because there's obviously a really, obviously a really easy way to translate some of our tool sets from PowerShell just into pure C Sharp and .NET. But you know, that's kind of the perspective of us going forward. We're still gonna write and use PowerShell, but we, we, see, you know, we see the writing on the wall, we're going forward and we don't, 
we still want to be able to provide kind of offensive value to our clients of simulating a bad guy. So if we go on an engagement, we don't want every single tool to not work. We at least want something we can kind of evolve and go with, which is sadly why we're starting to move. Well, good and bad. I guess bad for us, but like good for everybody else. Like we're starting to move away from PowerShell a little bit. That's pretty much it. Now, if there's any, I don't, I'm, I guess we're 12.05. People probably don't have questions. We can just do, oh, five more minutes? Oh, OK. Does uh, anyone have any questions by chance? And, and again, if you don't want to ask here, you can uh, just talk to me after. Yeah. No? No question? Yes. Yeah, Yes, uh, Lee has made a post for a week ago about something called Triple Agent. Have you seen that? Uh, sorry, is Triple Agent Lee Holmes? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not familiar with that post. Okay. Uh, I haven't really read into it. Sorry. Sorry. The one question I guess I can't answer is that's terrible on me. So. <laughs> Um, anyways, I, I have a few, uh, uh, no one cares about that. Um, I'm going to post these slides online and do, do everything else. So I have references for everybody. Thank you so much to, to Jared and Matt um, and everybody that's you know, either helped me out or built a lot of these really cool projects. And hopefully this is a little interesting of just letting people know what's out there as far as off offensive capabilities and defensive protections. You know, hope is obviously not lost. Uh, a whole bunch of other really, really cool stuff. And then I'm going to also have you know, links to every single project that I had. So it's a little small, but again, I'll post, I'll post these all online. So again, um, thank you guys for having me so much. Hopefully it was good. <laughs> <laughs>